Hello, this video is going to be of particular interest to any of you that love fighter jets, particularly Cold War British fighter jets, and in particular the English Electric Lightning. I'm Andrew Cynthia White, and I'm a global adventure travel filmmaker. Follow along as I share my hard learned lessons in storytelling, videography, and photography. I was lucky enough to make a documentary about Thunder City, which is the collection of warbirds, now closed, uh, that uh, once existed in Cape Town, and they actually, at one time, had four flying English electric lightnings, three buccaneers, and I think it was four, might have even been five, hawk hunters. And at that, and their, in their heyday, I made a documentary of that show. It's called Thunder and Lightnings. And during the production of that uh, video, I interviewed Brian Carroll. I was born in London in uh, 1932, so I'm uh, 45 and had a hard life. Now, Brian Carroll was the second highest hours wise uh, English Electric Lightning pilot in the Royal Air Force. He also worked with the Royal Saudi Air Force, and he has a story to tell that is I mean, fascinating. But before that, a short anecdote about how Brian took the controls of a lightning 20 years after he last sat in the cockpit. So the air show where I was lucky enough to actually fly in a buccaneer, I sat in the back. We went ahead of time and we witnessed Brian Carroll land a lightning having not sat in a cockpit for over 20 years. The amazing ability of this man. Now apparently Dave Stock, who was at the time, he's now passed away, um, he was the senior pilot at Thunder City and he would take people out for joy rides. They'd come and they'd spend 10,000 US dollars and have half an hour in a lightning and go supersonic. We're gonna go out there. Get this thing going. Take our time. Get as much thrust as we can before we release the brakes. And then get 600 knots as soon as possible and go straight up. Apparently the story goes that uh, David arrived after Brian had been taken out to and been strapped into the Lightning in a place that obviously he was very familiar with. And along came Dave and said, well, what have we got today? And they said, well, his name is Brian. Um, and he's from England, oh, very nice. And he said, what, well, uh, has he done his training? And they went, yeah, he, yes, they, he's definitely done his training. Uh, he's, well, what, what more? And, they, and, the, and somebody said, don't you know who this guy is? And apparently Dave didn't. And they said, it's Brian Carroll. Dave knew who Brian Carroll was. And he went, oh. And apparently he walked out in this daze and he climbed into the lightning, sat down, did up his straps and said, I'm not flying today. I'm not flying today. I'm sitting here today, but I'm not flying today. I don't, I'm not going to fly with you. If you want to fly with me, go for it. I'll tell you what, I'll do the radio for you. And apparently it went something like this. This was reported back by the guys who were strapping everybody in and prepping the aircraft. And Dave told me afterwards that he, he watched Brian fly absolutely meticulously. Just, he just reveled in watching this superb flyer, flies airplane. And they landed at Bredasdorp where I had already landed in the Buccaneer and they had uh, they were coming up behind us but Brian was doing the flying and I was on the ground at the time when Brian landed after 20 years landed and then had a shoot failure. Dave reported that this guy was he said he was comp he just nothing it was nothing and you watch the landing and I filmed it and as he landed the aeroplane the chute failed 
and the aircraft continued the entire length as a good two and a half, three mile runway, military strip. And he took up the entire, to slow the aircraft down, slow, doing what you're supposed to do. Touchdown short in case you have a, have, a, have a failure with something, so you've got lots of space, which he did. And Dave reported back that after 20 years, this guy was superb. He said he has never sat with anybody in his life who was so smooth, so accomplished. And he said it was one of the highlights of his flying career. Then uh, joined the Air Force as a, a national serviceman and had the good luck to um, get into flying training, which was really only for two years. Um, and I did rather well. Uh, I found flying was a natural ability, something I had no idea about. And I was then granted a permanent commission in the RAF and stayed in for 22 and a half years, uh, flying a variety of airplanes from uh, the Harvard on which I got my wings, uh, then went on to Meteors, flew the Hunters, uh, instructed on Vampires, flew Javelins and ultimately the Lightning. Um, and at that 22 year point I was staying in the Air Force, at least I thought I was, and I was invited by the British Aircraft Corporation, uh, now BAE, uh, to head up a new contract in Saudi Arabia as the Chief Flying Instructor for the Royal Saudi Air Force. And that was a job I had uh, for 10 years in Saudi. Um, so the Lightning was really my main aeroplane and I've accumulated just short of 3,000 hours of flying. Um, in the Air Force, uh, apart from normal squadron operational stuff, I was finished up as the uh, Chief uh, Examiner Strike Command and I would take teams of uh, instructors from RAF Coldershaw in Norfolk to RAF Germany, where we would uh, we were really known as the trappers. They didn't like us. Um, we would examine all the pilots on the squadron, both on the ground for their ground subjects and fly with all of them to make sure that their operational flying was uh, correct and up to standard. And um, we would write reports upon them. And if they failed, we would uh, tell them so, and we'd come back a week or two later and fly with them again. So. They, they were always very apprehensive when we arrived. Um, I can well remember going a couple of times uh, just for weekend jolly and taking, say, an engineer across uh, for a flight uh, and offering pilots on uh, either 19 or 92 uh, a trip and they would disappear at the speed of, speed of light. They did not want to fly with an examiner, even though it was going to be friendly and they wouldn't believe me. But then they'd say, no, you have a Mark II Lightning and you go and fly off on your own somewhere. So that, that was fine, I would do that. Um, so that was really my job in the Air Force at the end of the, uh, the time. Um, and then uh, as I went to Saudi, um, to Dharan, uh, and was there with the Chief Flying Instructor for the Saudi Air Force. And after being there about two months, the Colonel, who had been caretaking the unit, um, spoke to me for almost the first time. He'd been watching me and listening and monitoring what I was doing. And I had a very brief talk in his office for about half an hour. And he said, right, Brian, he said, the whole show is yours. I'm going to Riyadh, and he disappeared. So I had the whole unit then for the last 10 years. And very briefly, for the last year and a half, when we were converting, or the Saudis rather, were converting to the F-15, um, they asked me if I would also run 13 Squadron at the same base, which was an operational squadron. And uh, I was uh, given the honorary rank of Lieutenant Colonel, which equated to my RAF rank um, for that short period of time. They didn't pay me any more money, they just gave me the job. But um, it was fun and I enjoyed doing it. And uh, so that all finished in uh, 1982, 83, when I then came back to UK and uh, regrettably had to hang up my, my helmet. Um, but that said, uh, I think you maybe know that we still have three Lightnings in, in England. CAA will not allow us to fly them, which is a great shame. But we have two at Brundingthorpe, there's two F6s, that's the single seaters. And we do, I do fast demonstration runs there for air shows, uh, and that fast being 150 knots with the nose wheel raised, ready to lift off. Um, and then we have to stream the chute and throttle back and taxi back in again. Very frustrating. And I do a similar thing at uh, Cranfield, which is the university up uh, near Milton Keynes, uh, where we have a two-seater. Uh, and that too is, is uh, quite good fun. And we take passengers down the runway there, and they come back with a smile about three foot wide thinking it's fantastic. And I do brief them, don't blink, because if you do, you'll miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a bit about your flying 
some of the, the characteristics, what makes the lightning different, special? Well, I mean, performance of the lightning is really quite outstanding, and even by modern standards today, considering the lightning was uh, on the drawing boards in 1947, and that's going back many, many years, um, the quantum leap from the wartime, World War II, uh, and just after, when the meteors and the vampires are coming in, and they would do 520, 550, uh, and the lightning was a quantum leap. We're now looking at something going supersonic, which hadn't happened before. So it was just tremendous. And as I say, compared to F-16s, Mirages and such, the performance of the Lightning is still as good as anything around today. Um, okay, Eurofighter is a better aeroplane. It gets the height faster uh, and in cold power, whereas we need reheat for the Lightning. But that said, after 45 seconds from brake release, the Lightning is doing 450 knots. And 15 seconds later, it's doing a climb of 50,000 foot a minute. So you're getting to 36,000 feet in about two and a half minutes, still doing uh, 0.9 or 9 miles a minute. Um, service ceiling was 65,000 feet, which was comfortably high. I did on one occasion in Saudi on an air test with little else to do, see how high I could get the lightning, and I did get it to 87,300 feet. And it's quite dark, and curvature of the earth is very, very obvious at that height. Um, you can see it lower, you can see it at 65,000, but not quite so, not so apparent. Um, so that, that was quite uh, interesting and uh, very much on a knife edge, sort of doing close to Mark II and also being very close to the stalling speed because you've got indicated airspeed, which is quite low, but your true airspeed is still around about 1,400 miles an hour, so you're, you're moving very fast. But if you look at the indicated airspeed, you're almost stalling and falling out the sky. And you have to be very careful in those conditions because if you did over control it or if there was turbulence, which at that height is fairly unlikely, uh, the aircraft could in fact fall out of control and could tumble. And if it did that, there would be no means of recovering and it would just break up and uh, you would die. Uh, because at that time I didn't have the right equipment on to be that high, so I shouldn't really have been there, but I thought, well, why not? It's a good aeroplane, it's safe, I'm not really too worried. Um, I don't know whether you want to hear about a, a near bailout condition that we had in Saudi, which might be of interest to people. Um, I had a, a student airborne on what was his first trip. He had not flown the Lightning at all. He'd done some simulator work. He'd done some ground school work. And this is what we used to call the instructor's benefit ride. So we'd put the student in the right-hand seat. We would fly it from the left-hand seat and we'd say, right now, we will, I will now show you what this aeroplane can do. So we would do the maximum rate takeoff, climb to height, go supersonic, maximum rate descent. Um, we'd done all of this uh, with this chap, I'd done all of this, and we're then down over the desert at about two or 300 feet, uh, accelerated to about 650 knots, and then just took it up into a vertical climb. And all was well until then. And we were going through about 22,000 feet when I had a reheat fire and a reheat one warning came on. And now this is fairly major emergency. Um, so I obviously closed the engine down, we rolled over, leveled out, uh, I put out a mayday call. We were about 100 miles south. What does it actually mean? That, that those, those, those warning alarms, what was, was there a fire? Okay, fire, fire one, the engine, number one engine had a fire, and there was also a reheat fire on the same engine, which is further back. Now the, the, the danger there is that you've got a fire extinguisher for the engine, you don't have one for the reheat department. So this is quite a problem, or could be quite a problem. So you do all the drills, you, you, you close the engine down, you slow the aircraft down, you use the fire extinguishers, and then you wait for the lights to go out. It has what they call a triple FD system, uh, free from fault. So if the light stays on, the fire is still burning. If the light goes out, the fire's gone out. It says in small print, and I'll come to that a bit later on. So we put out the Mayday call, I did all the drills, and bear in mind my student was on his first ever trip in this aeroplane. I looked across, and we carry flip cards with all the takeoff, startup procedures, all the emergency procedures. He actually got the flip card out and was reading the emergency procedure for the problem that we had. And he spoke to me and said, well, sir, he said, have we done all the drills? And I said, yes. I said, but read them again, and we'll do them again, which we did, and all was fine. Now he said, what do we do? I said, now we don't panic. Okay, he said, and he sat back and relaxed. So we then set up a, a slow recovery with a, my number two engine on, just an idle to fast idle setting, 
and a, a slow glide back at 250 knots. And you have to stay above 10,000 feet for at least five minutes to wait for the fire to go out. If it's still burning, it can burn the control rods through and suddenly you're out of control and the thing's going to crash. There's no means of landing this aeroplane without hydraulics. You've got to have hydraulic control. The lights went out and we continued our approach to Dharan, doing a slightly high, slightly fast, straight in approach to land. And all looked pretty good, except that by now my main flight instruments had failed for whatever reason. They just completely failed. So I had the standby instruments and that's, that's fine. You can do it on that. And about half a mile from touchdown, I had complete failure of every instrument in the cockpit. Nothing worked. And Sorry about the noise. So every, everything had failed in the cockpit. I had no instruments at all. We were then, by then we were committed. We were too low. Uh, there's no question of bailing out. So I just continued on just a fixed setting and we landed, stopped at the far end, the fire crew were there, we got out, and to my horror, the back end of the aircraft was still on fire, even though the warnings had gone out. Uh, and in fact, I have, um, if you're familiar with solder, if you melt solder and let it drop on the ground, you get a nice sort of splodge of solder. Well, I have a disc about inch and a half across of molten lightning fuselage engraved with the aircraft 716 and the date, and the reheat fire, and the reheat one fire, on a little keychain, which I keep at home, but I don't want to lose it. Uh, but that, that was um, quite an experience. But that's, the, that's as close as I've ever come to maybe having to bail out, and we didn't do it on that day either. Operationally, was the lightning very successful? It was. I've got to come back now, really, to, to UK to talk about that. I was based at RAF Lucas on the 23 Squadron for a number of years. And from there, when the Cold War was still on, we would scramble off to intercept uh, Russian bears off the Iceland Ferries Gap. Um, so we'd get a scramble day or night, any time of the day or night. We were always on uh, alert. Uh, we would take off and we would then fly north and rendezvous with a tanker. That was the Victor Tankers, which had been scrambled in plenty of time. And we'd stay with them for a while, uh, often using purely silent procedure. We didn't want to let the Russians know we were en route. Uh, we would refuel on the tanker. Uh, we then break away from the refuel, leave the tanker maybe 300 miles north of base and then accelerate away, go and find the bears, take photographs, um, make friendly visual signals to them or otherwise. They would do the same to us. Uh, they would try and take our photographs too but we were somewhat more manoeuvrable than the bear which as you probably know is a huge bomber. Um, on a more than one occasion I would be alongside the tail taking photographs and I could see a Russian photographer inside with a huge camera with a, on a tripod, setting it up. And as soon as he had it set up, I'd just roll over the fin and go to the other side, look back in, and he'd be walking back across with this tripod and camera, setting it up, and I'd roll back the other side. And I think all he ever got was a shot of my tail plane going away with the reheats burning. Um, whereas I got lots of photographs where we used to just carry a 35 millimeter camera and just uh, take shots as we wanted. But uh, yeah, it was good stuff, and we, we did that. And, uh, I suppose the only, I had one very unusual intercept one night. I was scrambled off and always, we always went north. We expected to go north, um, out of Luce, and we went due east. And I was on my own. My number two had failed, my number two aircraft had failed, so he didn't go with me. I was just on my own. And they, they sent me out east. And I went east for forever, and the Dutch coast was coming up. I could see it on my radar. And they finally came up and said, We now have a target for you, crossing right to left on a northerly heading. Uh, we require a positive identification. Now, it, was, it was at night, it was very dark, extremely dark. I finally rolled in about a mile or a bit less behind this aircraft and it had no lights on at all, which is very unusual, it was just no lights. Um, the radar we had had what we call a vis-ident facility which enabled you to get in very, very close on this, this particular mode. And it would sometimes hold lock, sometimes wouldn't. This was particularly good, it held lock right down, in fact, less than the minimum. And I got right in behind this. In fact, I finished up underneath this aircraft in the dark with no lights on. And I, I simply couldn't see it. It was a black aircraft, or appeared to be, against a very black sky. And I sat there for quite a long time. And I called radar and said, I cannot see this aircraft. I just cannot see it. It's just too dark. It's got no lights. And they came back and said, you must identify it. Essential, you must identify it. And eventually, there was just the vaguest outline of black against less black, or the other way around. 
And I said, well, I don't know. It might be a KC-135. And as soon as I said that, all the lights in the world on this aeroplane came on. He knew that I was underneath him, thank God, because if he'd moved, it would have crashed. And the ground radar said, that's affirmative. Yes, we knew what it was. We just wanted to check. Um, were they testing you? They were testing me, I guess. Or the system. I'm not sure which. Um, and by then, I, I was having to make a decision. Do I now go into Norway, because I was getting low on fuel, and land somewhere in Norway, or do I get back to Lucas? Um, and being a KC-135, I said, well, could I have some fuel? And he said, negative. And I thought, well, that's friendly. <laughs> he was American, of course. Um, however, I did have enough fuel, and I got back, back to Lucas, and uh, all was well. But that, that was an interesting intercept, and uh, quite, uh, quite difficult. Anything else that you can think of that is... Did you fly back in the at all? No, I didn't. No, uh, no. Just uh, the hunters I flew. Um, that, that was quite good. We, we flew hunters. Uh, we converted on the squadron when hunters very first came into service. So there were no two-seaters, which was quite nice. So um, we had Neville Duke, the test pilot from Dunsfold, and Bill Bedford, the other test pilot. They came up to Lucas and we sat in the crew room and we drank coffee. And they talked to the crews, all the pilots, about how the hunter was to fly and what you should or shouldn't do and what it was like. And we read the pilot's notes and we did little, uh, little written tests so that we knew the speeds and all the limitations. And I was walked out to my aeroplane with uh, Bill Bedford. Um, and we walked around it and we, I got in and he helped me strap in and patted me on the head and said, have fun. And off I went. And uh, it was great. It was great. And I never did fly a two-seat hunter. Yeah, uh, so that, that was good fun. Anything else that you can think of that is a, you think is a worthwhile... In terms of worthwhile story, yes, I suppose there's at least one more from Saudi. Um, one of my students, I'd briefed him to go off on a solo trip one day, and the weather was marginal, but it was okay, and he wasn't just solo, he'd been solo several times. And he was briefed to do a particular sortie, and we always worked south of Dharan. We never worked north of the airfield. And I went off shortly after him and did an air test, and uh, I heard him in the air, and he was lost. He called up, said, I'm lost, I'm lost. Uh, we had um, a facility in the Lightning out there that we could actually get a bearing on a transmission, so I was doing a sort of slow orbit round and asking him to transmit, to try and pick up a bearing, and I couldn't get one. He didn't know where he was. He could only see vertically down because of blowing sand. He was a, horizontal visibility was, was poor. I can't remember now exactly what it was, but it wasn't very good. And he, he was just lost, and I couldn't find him. And I knew where he should be. And I just couldn't find him on radar. Ground radar couldn't find him. Nobody could find him. And uh, eventually I had to land, and I landed, taxi back, went into the crew room. And I said, well, this, this, I won't mention his name, but I said, he's on the ground somewhere. He's either crashed, or he's bailed out, or he's landed. Heaven knows where. And a couple of minutes later, the phone rang, and I happened to be standing by the phone. I picked it up, and it was this pilot on the telephone. And I said, fantastic, where are you? He said, I'm at Kafji. Now, Kafji, just to, for those who don't know, was the northernmost town in Saudi that the Iraqis invaded uh, during uh, the Gulf War. Uh, it was a little, little oil terminal there. The Japanese ran it, and a little, very, very short, 300-foot strip. Uh, 3,000 foot strip, sorry. And this guy had spiralled down, having spotted a runway, and as he came in to land, the wind increased from maybe 10 knots to 70 knots, straight down the runway. Now they all believe that Allah does look after their own, and I do too, because there was no way he could have landed on that runway with anything less. So he, he finished at the far end, this tarmac atom was so soft that the wheels were almost submerged. The, the aircraft just sank into this tarmac. It was that soft. Anyway, we, by now we had a C-130 airborne from uh, Riyadh. So we, put, we called it into Dharam. We loaded ground equipment. And uh, I went up with the C-130 to this little airfield to see if we could fly the aeroplane out. So they had to jack it up, put in PSP, this sort of uh, perforated steel sheeting. Uh, jack it up, change the wheels and everything. Um, I borrowed a car from the local Emir to go down the runway, which was like the rocky road to Dublin. It was very undulating and very soft tarmac, not very long. And I did some calculations and I worked out that I, had, I could just get enough fuel in the aeroplane 
to get back to Dharan, but any more, I wouldn't get airborne. So it, it was, you know, just on a balance like that. So the following morning, very early, I can't remember the time, about 7 o'clock, it might have been 6.30, oh, we all got out there and we had the aeroplane towed to the far end of the, the runway, again on PSB matting so it wouldn't sink in. The Emir and all his entourage were there, still about five foot off the wingtip, and I said, look, you ought to move them away because it's going to get quite noisy in a minute, and they wouldn't move. So I got started up and I said, well, I'm going to actually run this to full cold power on the brakes uh, until it starts to creep. It wouldn't hold full cold power, it would start to, the, the brakes would start to let it creep. I'm then going to hit full reheat before I roll, because I said, I'm going to need every inch of runway. And it proved to be so because the C-130 crew, the Americans, were at the far end and they reckon I had, well, they said a foot left. I think I, they lied. I think I had three foot of runway left when it, when it finally unstuck. Um, got this machine airborne, um, actually just in fringe Kuwaiti airspace because it was that close to the border. And I, and I threw a hard turn, but I, I couldn't avoid going over. And they, they got a bit upset, but that was too bad. Um, climbed up to 36,000 feet and headed back for Dharan. And I was about 80 miles out from Dharan when they called up and said that Dharan weather had gone red and I was to divert to Bahrain. And I said, well, I don't have the fuel, I can't do that. And they said, well, it's red, you can't land here, it's, the weather's it's right out. And I said, well, watch me. Um, I said, so I got a GCA, a ground controlled approach, uh, monitored it with our onboard ILS. Um, I'd had a couple of failures on the way back, instrument failures, but nothing critical, it didn't really matter too much. Um, and anyway, I, I got it in, that was the main thing, and uh, land in, taxi it in, and the, the base, the station commander, the base commander, uh, the Saudi, uh, he came down and uh, he said, any problems? I said, no, not really, it's fine. He said, oh, thanks very much, and off he went. And I never did get the gold watch, I thought I might have got for that. <laughs> but it was an yeah, interesting time. In yeah. Yeah. Great. Oh, uh, that's, that's about me, I think.